Strap on your boots, roll up your socks, and remember where you put your mouth guard. It's time to talk footy. This is Selling the Dummy, the AFL discussion show on Biz 99.9 FM Substitute Radio. I'm your host, Chucka Wilson. Among other things, I am Biz 99.9 FM's Managing Director of Sports Production. I'm joined by one of the most esteemed intellectuals of the football commentariat. He's a brilliantly insightful radio commentator. He's an internationally syndicated columnist. He's been appearing on our TVs every Sunday morning for as long as we can remember. He's Shane Scooter Coots. Welcome to the program, Scooter. G'day, Chuck. Glad to be here. This is a very special program of Selling the Dummy because it's our annual review and highlights program. AFL 2017, the season that was. The home and away season is over, the buy round has come and gone, and we're well and truly into the final series. So this gives us an opportunity to look back and reflect on the season that we've had. But before we get to that, I would actually like to begin this podcast by looking at last night's match. Scoot up, was this the best match that we've seen in a final series in a generation? You can easily put up that argument. That was a fantastic game last night, watching West Coast and Port Adelaide both go hard at it, both pretty evenly matched up sides. West Coast had a bit more finals experience, and I think that came through in the end after extra time there. Uh, but Port Adelaide were definitely worthy of being in that finals position. So, uh, yeah, no, uh, no dramas with either side winning that game. Both were very well deserving. And what about the other games that we've seen this final series? Adelaide overcoming GWS significantly, Richmond defeating Geelong significantly, and then Sydney walloping Essendon. Yeah, it's been actually a one-sided final series for the other three games until last night's one. Essendon, I think, achieved what they needed to prior to the, the final series, coming back from the, the Asada uh, bands for those players, the fact that they were able to finish seventh after that. A tremendous feat, so I think they'd already run their race. Somewhat surprised that Sydney comfortably got the job done there. Gino was probably the biggest disappointment over the weekend. I think they were a little bit unlucky to be fourth. They're, they're probably not the fourth best side. They're probably closer to that second or third best team, so you would have expected them to put up more of a fight there rather than score six goals across the four quarters there, so they should be tremendously disappointed, and yeah, they should be bouncing back next week. Um, as for Geelong and Richmond, well, Richmond were just on fire on Friday night there. They've put themselves right up in premiership credentials there, getting a home preliminary final in two weeks' time there, so keep an eye for Richmond. OK, we're going to take a quick break. This is Selling the Dummy on Biz 99.9 FM Substitute Radio. Welcome back to Selling the Dummy on Beers 99.9 FM Substitute Radio. I'm Chucka Wilson and I'm joined by Shane Scooter Coots. I want to ask you, Scooter, was 2017 a good year for the AFL? Was the football of the highest quality and the best spirit? And is the AFL as a sporting league in good health? Look, in all honesty, I think the AFL is in a perfect position at the moment where, where it wants to be. The um, equalisation methods that they've put in place there are starting to come through there. Uh, we've never had more results decided by less than one goal. So in those uh, way of looking at things, absolutely, it is very healthy there. The game took itself to China and overseas for just the second time there, China for the first time, and that obviously expands the game as well there. So looking at it from that perspective, absolutely, it's in good health there. And certainly with crowd attendances up with the success of Richmond, that also helps the game as well. Okay, so we're going to do our AFL teams review. So we're going to go through all of the 18 teams, and I want to know, are they going well? Are they in form? Are they in a good position? Did they have a very good 2017? So let's begin with the minor premiers, Adelaide. Adelaide are probably the most exciting team because they were in the doldrums just a couple of years ago and then they've shot up. They were 7th two years ago, they were 5th last year and now they're in 1st place. Surely they are the most exciting team currently in AFL. 
Look, 100%, they're one of the more high-scoring teams in the competition there with a, a potent forward line. When you look at the likes of Jenkins, Walker, Betts and Cameron, those sort of guys are really firing for Adelaide at the moment there. So absolutely, they're in good steads there. They've come a long way uh, since the, the passing of Phil Walsh and Don Pike's done a fantastic job with the group there. None of them seem to be in that retirement sort of bracket at the moment, so it also doesn't have to be this year for Adelaide. I certainly think they are the favourites at the moment for the Premiership there, but if they happen to fall short there, I think they can go again next year there. So really in good sense at the moment, Adelaide. Let's go to the other side of the ladder, the Brisbane Lions. They are stuck at the bottom after getting it into 12th place four years ago. They're now stuck right at the bottom. So Brisbane were 17th in 2015, 17th in 2016, and now they are 18th this year. So they are right down at the bottom. They are basically occupying Melbourne's old position of being the worst team in the AFL. Unfortunately, you're actually right there. They've certainly suffered a lot from a lot of players leaving to other clubs. You look at the likes of Elliot Yayo, you look at Sam Doherty. Um, and there's others as well. Jared Pohl that comes to mind. So, look, certainly they've lost a lot of players and that's certainly stunted their, their growth as a side. In recent memory, they're probably actually the best 18th place side that we've had. They've certainly come a long way of their development. Uh, Dane Beams and Dane Zorko have led from the front there, have done a fantastic job. They just need to make sure they keep hold of their younger players to move up the ladder. Keeping in mind that they actually only finished last after the last round results when they lost to a fight up North Melbourne that day, so they were almost able to escape the wooden spoon, but it's not the worst thing in the world for them to finish last uh, this year. They get the number one draft pick and the number one preseason draft pick, so there's certainly opportunities there to recruit some more players there, and then keep all the younger players, they'll move up the land in the not too distant future. Can you please explain Richmond to me? They were in 5th place in 2013, 8th place in 2014, 5th place in 2015, and then they fell down to 13th place last year, and now they've shot all the way up to 3rd place, it's almost as if they're on an elastic band. Look, Richmond are actually a lot better than what last year suggested there, but one of the things to keep in mind with the, the fixturing is that 13th is actually probably the best place to finish if you're not going to play finals, because of the fact that that way you'll draw next year, you get fixed against other of the bottom six sides there. So Richmond were the beneficiaries of playing against bottom sides twice, and certainly took advantage of that by not dropping any of those easy games, as well as their own development with a younger group there. And again, knocking off some better sides as well, including West Sydney at the MCG during the season. So they've certainly come a long way. And one of the things to keep in mind, similar to Adelaide, is that no one's in that retirement bracket at the moment. So again, it doesn't have to be this year for Richmond there. They can certainly go again next year. Only Ivan Marich is set to be retiring from the group. The rest can be their own controlled list management decisions there. So look, Richmond can be at the top for a few years to come there uh, with their unique uh, game style of only having the one tall forward there in Jack Rewalt and going for the smaller types as well there. So um, this is actually sustain now. 2016 was the blip in the radar, but again, with that fixturing, it could actually be the blessing in disguise for this group. Let's talk about Hawthorne for a second. They are probably the best team of the last decade. They were going for a four premiership in a row just last year. They got into first place in 2013, second place in 2014, third place in 2015, and they won the premierships all those years. And then last year, they got into third place so an amazing top four spot in the last four years, and they have plummeted down to 12th for this year. What is an explanation for this? Well, the simple explanation is that it's a brand new group there. They got rid of a couple of players last year via the trade period. They got rid of Jordan Lewis and Sam Mitchell there, and losing a lot of experience as well with that. John Segler injured himself late last year, so he's unfortunately missed the whole year, which has hurt their ruck stocks there. But with the retirements and injuries, it's given a chance for younger players to develop. Ryan Burton was the run-up in the Rising Star Award. So that's an, an example of where the younger players have started to come through for Hawthorne. So in some ways, this was the year that had to happen for them. They had to slip down the ladder. Um, but certainly with the previous group winning all those premierships, it was definitely all worth it. Now it's about Alistair Clarkson getting this new group coming through again. And, and certainly they're well on track with that. Speaking of the best teams of the last 10 years, the other one who is competing with Hawthorne for that mantle is, of course, Geelong. Now, Geelong had a blip year in 2015 where they fell to 10th place, but other than that, they've been in the top four. It seems like they have been able to create two generations in a row of top-notch AAA-grade players, so the generation that won the premierships in 07, 09 and 11 are gone, and they've got another group of players which are just as good. Yeah, they've turned themselves into the destination club for players to go to there, whereby it's uh, attractive for players to have a look at 
they're able to work trades because players actually want to come to Geelong. Uh, best examples of that would be guys like Zach Smith, uh, Patrick Dangerfield, and these guys. So they're able to stock up their, their players via the trade period and not necessarily have to rely on rebuilding via the draft there. Mind you, they've actually done well with their draft picks as well there. So it's a mixture of, of both of those two. So look, look certainly Geelong will, will still be up there even after this year. I think they've still got to get through some um, development, especially in that bottom six group. They do seem to like a little bit of depth in that, but if they can develop, they'll certainly still be up there in the coming years. Let's talk about Fremantle for a second. So there was that period of time where they were one of the best teams in the AFL. They were getting into the top four of the ladder, and there was a real chance of them winning the Premiership for a couple of years, and they got into the Grand Final once. And then they didn't just slip, but they collapsed. So they got into 16th place last year, and now basically the same thing. They're in 14th place this year. So they're not even making the finals anymore. So like they have completely imploded. What is wrong with Freeman? Well, what's been typical of the Ross Lyon coach groups there, and it happened at St Kilda, was that there's a heavy reliance on the older players there, and Fremantle's a perfect example of that, uh, with the examples of Aaron Sanderlands, Michael Johnson, Matthew Pavlich before he retired, uh, before the start of this season. There's a heavy reliance on those older players there. So I think with this current group, they're starting to not do that. They're starting to make sure that the younger players are more important than that fifths, the locking Neals of the team there. However, they are going to be at the bottom for a few years to come there. I think 14th was almost an overachievement when you look at some of the games they lost towards the end of the and the start of the year with some heavy margins. So perhaps 14th was a little bit overs. But again, with that fixture next year where they can play against other bottom six teams twice, they may be able to hold their place on the ladder there. But I don't think slipping down the ladder will be all bad. They'll get a higher draft pick than in the 2018 draft there. And even in this draft, they can certainly attack with that one. So we mentioned Geelong before, the team that seems to not fall down into a period of rut but continues to win. Let's move to another team that also has this condition, which is Sydney. It has been 13 years since they won their famous premiership in 2005, and in this period of time, they are still one of the best teams in the AFL. They have gotten into the top four in the last previous four years, and they got into sixth place this year. So they continue to be one of the most highest performing, most talented teams in the AFL. Another one of those sides with a fantastic uh, culture and one of those destination clubs we touched on before there. So, look, Sydney is certainly uh, one of the premier sides of the competition there. Their slow start, starting 0-6, and six, was almost a blessing disguise for them sort of got the group to have a look at the way they were going about their footy and to make sure that they got back focused there. Some shock losses even to Carlton at the MCG there uh, certainly then sparked the revival, whereby they've only lost to one side since round six, and that's been Hawthorne on a couple of occasions there. So there it certainly should be a whole lot higher than their zero and six start suggested there, and finishing six on the ladder was a perfect uh, reflection on their whole season. But look, they're probably one of the best sixth place teams we've ever had there because even cutting into uh, the coming weeks of finals there, they'd almost be favourite against every team they play against. So uh, look out for Sydney in the coming weeks. Let's talk about the two youngest clubs in the AFL. Let's start with GWS. Now, when they first broke onto the AFL, obviously they were one of the worst teams. They kept losing and kept getting the bottom of the ladder. But their rise up has been remarkable. In 2015, they got up to 11th place, and then last year, they got into 4th place, and then this year, 4th place. So it seems like GWS has done what the AFL hoped would happen to these new clubs. They would get a group of players together that would become talented and high-skilled performing and really start to win serious games. They certainly went about the right way with their original recruiting there. When you look back at when they first became an AFL club there, they got the right players at the right ages, either at that really young bracket or at the really end scale where, where they only recruit players to play for a couple of years, but then they became assistant coaches there. So they got the wisdom from those players there. Uh, James McDonald, Dean Brogren, Chad Corns, these types. So they recruited well when they started, a lot better than the club we'll mention a little bit later on. And, and right at the moment there, they're certainly right up there in terms of the, the sides. Most expected them to be the flag favourites this year with the group in terms of their age. But again, it doesn't have to be this year. There, They've got a couple of players in that retirement bracket. Steve Johnson's already announced his retirement there. Brett Delivio has only got one or two more years. So 
it doesn't necessarily have to be up to those players to win them that premiership there. But this year, there's, there's still a chance. They're still in it. Um, we certainly expected them to be a lot higher this year than fourth. Uh, that rise it was actually all expected there with the players now reaching that mid-20s range whereby they're reaching the peaks of their careers there. So it doesn't have to be this year for GWS. But again, they're probably falling a little bit short this year considering last year. And now let's move on to the other team, the Gold Coast. They have been perhaps one of the most disappointing teams in the AFL over the last 10 years. There was this one period in 2014 where they were able to get up to ninth place, but other than that, they have been near the bottom of the ladder consistently, and it just seems that the whole Gold Coast experiment has been a complete failure. Well, they've still got an opportunity now to develop this current group, which is a little bit younger than when they first started. As opposed to the way GWS went about it, Gold Coast got players that were in their prime. Look at guys like Jared Harbrow, Gary Ablett, Jared Brennan, Josh Fraser, all of them in the mid to late 20s, because they were expecting to not be at the bottom to begin with there. Unfortunately, what we learnt is that these clubs definitely need time there, and so by the time the younger players had time to develop, the, old, the players that were recruited were coming older, retired, and then those players who were developing through were perhaps a little bit overrated, and so now they've been moved on, and they're building up with a new crop again there. So last draft, they got four picks in the top ten in the end, so they had the opportunity there to recruit, and they've done actually quite a good job with that. They've got to make sure they've got to hold on to their players there. So it's not all doom and gloom, but the summer of being the most disappointing club over the last few years is exactly right there. Everyone expected them to be playing finals and being there with GWS, perhaps a Gold Coast GWS grand final this year. But at this point, Gold Coast won't be playing finals for a few years to come. Let's talk about some of the other teams that have been able to make it into the finals this year. So let's start with Port Adelaide. And Port Adelaide are a strange team. They continue to win more games than they lose, and yet they've never been able to compete with the top teams. They are always in the, the second four in terms of fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth. And they've never been able to break into that top four. But then again, they've never had to fall you know, into the doldrums, even though they missed out on the finals in a couple of years. So they're still a good team, but not a great team. Well said, and they've actually recruited really well there, which has made sure they were able to hold off any drops there. I think Ken Hingley's got the right idea now of this group. They're, they're certainly younger than what they have been previously there uh, and not reliant too heavily on, on too few plays there. Um, their recruits have gone really well. Um, when you look at the guys like uh, Paddy Ryder now, All-Australian there, and uh, Carl Amon and these younger guys also. So they've done it both really well in terms of the draft and the trade period there. So it doesn't really have to be this year for Port Adelaide there. The one thing to keep an eye on, though, is that they may lose depth. Uh, Jack Trengrove is one guy that uh, they're potentially going to lose to free agency there, so they've got to make sure that they do keep up their depth there. Whether they do it via the trade or the draft period, yet to be seen there. Um, but look, certainly when you finish fifth there, you don't necessarily have a lot to work with with trades, so they may just have to do it via the draft. One of the teams that is most confusing and difficult to understand is West Coast. They fell down to 13th place in 2013, they just missed out on the finals in 2014. They plummeted to 16th place in 2015. Then they got into 6th place last year, and now they're in 8th place. So, exactly how good are West Coast? It doesn't make much sense. Still being a bit of a mystery there, it summarises the, the group as a whole there, that they haven't quite been good enough. Uh, they've actually got a lot of players uh, exiting the club at the end of the year due to retirement. You've got Sam Butler, Sam Mitchell, and also Matt Prittis as well there, just to name a few there. But they're also looking at some of the older guys in Josh Hill, John Giles, uh, Mark Lacroix as well there to sort of bring through that next wave there. So 2015 was their chance, in all honesty, when they made the grand final against Hawthorne. Not necessarily the fact that they were better than Hawthorne that year, but the fact that they were second there and they were, they were quite comfortably the second best team in that particular year there. So that was their opportunity with that group. They missed out, and it's now time to, to move on with the next group there. They were a little bit lucky to finish eighth, in all honesty. The fact that they happened to draw Adelaide, who happened to have nothing to play for in that last round. So they're probably more of a ninth or tenth team this year there, and most of the, the attention via the media has been that. Full credit to them, though. They took their opportunity when they've made the eight there and, and won a final and could very well win in the week to come there. So West Coast have surprised us, uh, certainly in, over the last few weeks there. But again, it is time for a new group. This group that they've got at the moment won't be a premiership winning group. It's time to get the young guys in. It's time to talk about two of the teams that are some of the most disappointing because they had some really talented players and they were winning lots of games only about five or ten years ago and they haven't been able to make the most 
of their opportunities and now have plummeted into the doldrums. So let's look at Carlton. Now there was a brief period where Carlton were making the finals and you started thinking maybe they could win a premiership and they have well and truly collapsed. Uh, 13th place, 18th place, 14th place and now this year 16th place. They are one of the worst teams in the AFL despite not that long ago being premiership contenders. Well they've certainly done well with their number one draft picks Carlton there when you look at Matthew Cruiser, you look at Bryce Gibbs, you look at Mark Murphy there. They've done well with their first picks, but it's the other picks that haven't gone so well there, and therefore they're relying on too few to win their games there. And even currently, this year, they're still probably relying on those too few. You look at the guys like Cade Simpson there, Sam Doherty, who we mentioned leaving Brisbane Lions there, uh, players that they rely heavily on, it's too few. So that bottom six group, they need to develop there, and they need to be given time there. And, and they've done well with this draft. They've gotten five Rising Star nominations over this year, so they are coming a long way. One thing to keep in mind is they didn't score over 100 one game this year, so they've got to find a way to start scoring goals. They've got the right developing guys, good guys like uh, Charlie Kerno and Harry McKay, so they've got guys there that can develop and score goals, but it may just be more of a game plan for Brendan Bolton to look at to go, OK, we've shored up the back line, we've kept teams low scores for our wins this year, but how are we going to get those winning scores on the board to turn a 5 or 6 win season into a 7 or 8 win season next year and move up the ladder? The Western Bulldogs have taught us that even if you make it into the finals and the second four, you still are premiership contenders. This isn't just a game for the top four. And so when you look at North Melbourne, for three consecutive years, they made it into the finals in that second lot of four, sixth place in 2014, and then eighth place both in 2015 and 2016. And so even though they were not one of the best teams in, in the AFL, they were still a good, admirable team. And this year has been very disappointing. They have not been able to continue reaching that mark that they have been for the last few years. It's interesting to look at North Melbourne in terms of whether they did overachieve with the previous group there. You mentioned before how they were finishing in the bottom half of the top eight there. They were still winning through and making preliminary finals. They got to the preliminary final against uh, Sydney in 2014 and also against West Coast in 2015 that we mentioned before there. So... Whether that group overachieved or whether they underachieved by finishing 6th or 8th is is one that could be debated in bars for years to come there. However, similar to the West Coast conversation, North Melbourne realised that now it's time to get a new group through. And with the delistings last year of Harvey, Ferrito, Del Santo and Petrie, and also uh, Daniel Wells and Robin Nahas moving on as well. So they are starting to get the new crop in. I don't think it's going to be a case of a sharp rise up the ladder. There are going to be a few years in the lower half of the ladder. I don't think they have to go as low as 18th to do that. And with this draft coming up, they will have pick four as their first one. So they can attack either via a, a trade to secure someone like a Josh Kelly, or they can get one of the best players in the draft there. So they're on the right track. It's just going to take a few years for them. Let's go to the other side of the equation now. There are a couple of teams that have been doing very poorly and losing lots of games over the last few years, but this season they've been able to bounce back and have been able either to get into the finals or fell just short. So Essendon, they were in 15th place in 2015, 18th place in 2016, and now have rised up to 7th place. Like, it's an amazing bounce back. Amazing is a perfect word for it. Getting those players back from their 12-month suspensions from the Asada uh, scandal was was big for them. They had to get those players back on the ground, back playing, back enjoying their footy there. And for most of them, that was the case there. There are a couple who decided to either call it quits before the start of the year or have only going to play the one season when you look at guys like Brent Stetton and Joe Watson retiring. So uh, with Essendon, they've still got... Uh, more room to, to work with in terms of their younger players. They've gotten McGrath there from the number one draft pick from coming last last season, and he won the, the Ram Rising Star there. So they are getting good younger players coming through. The one thing that worries me is their depth, especially in the midfield. You look at guys like Zach Merritt and Dyson Heppel there, two A graders, but then it falls off after that there. So either via the trade period or via the draft, they are going to have to get a couple more of those star midfielders there. So maybe someone like a Tom Rockcliffe via free agency might be the way to go there. They've certainly got the salary cap room to do that as well there. But full credit to them. I think they have overachieved a little bit, and that's why they lost that final against Sydney there. Uh, but look, yeah, certainly there is a, there's a lot to work with at Essendon. The other team that fits into this category is Melbourne. 
So for a very long time, Melbourne were the joke of the AFL, where they might win one or two games a season. And this happened for a long stretch of time. In the last couple of years, this stopped happening, where they got to win four or five games in the year. They got into 13th place in 2015 and 11th place in 2016. So they weren't the worst team, but they were still pretty poor. And now they've shot up to ninth place, where they were in the top eight for most of the home and away season. So it seems like the light at the end of the tunnel has finally approached Melbourne, and they are now a competent team once again. Yeah, light at the end of the tunnel is the perfect way to summarise Melbourne. They've come a long way since those dark days there previously, over the, the start of the millennium there. It's a really good advocate for anyone who has any doubts about whether a coach can make a big influence on a playing group or whether it's more to do with the players. The fact they got Paul Ruse in there for a few years there, got a, a plan there with Simon Goodwin to take over. It was a fantastic plan. They worked well together. And even though it wasn't straight away, and Paul Ruse acknowledged that openly in the media there, he certainly has got them on the right track there. So it's all looking up for Melbourne there. They'll be bitterly disappointed about non banking finals. That they were... They were thinking there were absolute certainties to make finals come into that last round there, but results didn't go their way, and so they find themselves having an earlier man Monday than what they would have liked there. But look, they'll be playing finals next year. You can just about lock it in today. In 2010, St Kilda and Collingwood played in the AFL Grand Final, and in the seven years that have passed, both of them have failed to regenerate, uh, continue their winning ways, and they have plummeted and yet they're kind of stuck. They haven't been able to bounce back into the top eight, and yet they haven't collapsed into the doldrums of the bottom four. Instead, they're sort of situating there in the third four, where they're not competing for the eight, where they're not near the wooden spoon. So Collingwood were 11th place in 2014, 12th in 2015, 12th last year, and now 13th. So they're stuck in this spot like, what is wrong with Collingwood? Well, Collingwood have actually got quite a young group there, so I'm actually not too worried about them being 13th at this point in time. Richmond's a perfect example. They can launch from 13th there. They've gone from 13th to 3rd. Collingwood may very well be that side next year there. When you look at the quality they've got, especially in their midfield, the likes of Adams, Trelaw, Pendlebury, Sidebottom, they've certainly got a lot there. They've probably topped too heavy in the midfield and haven't looked enough at those key position players. And so having a look at what they can do via the trade period, maybe they go after a Trent Grove, who we mentioned before, or Alia Alia from Sydney, who can't get a game in the moment there. There's opportunities there for them to get key position players who are in the right age bracket, that early to mid-20s there. So look, Collingwood are 13th right at the moment, but I'm actually not too worried about them. I think they can shoot up right up the ladder very soon there. And that's probably what uh, Colin were looking at with Nathan Buckley there, the fact that he's got a young enough group that they can go up the ladder there. So let's not just go after Buckley and get a new coach in there. Let's give him a crack with this playing group. So they've kept slipping, but now they think they can rise. And the other team from that equation that played in that 2010 grand final is St Kilda. St Kilda are one of the mysteries of the AFL because shortly after 2010, they collapsed into the bottom four where they could barely win a game. And then they've rebuilt to a certain extent. So now they got into ninth place last year and 11th place this year. So they are much better than what they were just a few years ago. And yet they haven't been able to break into the top eight. St Kilda's a bit more of a worrying one from a future ladder perspective there. They've, they've got young players coming through there and they've got players at the right age bracket. But the fact that at the end of this season they're losing Nick Rewalt and Lee Montagna, two of their more older guys there... That's big. So for me, I was thinking they would make finals this year, and they could very well make finals next year there. But they're starting to run out of time there with this group to be a premiership contender there until they have to actually start looking at the next group of players there, which considering they were last place only three seasons ago, like you talked about before there, it is worrying the fact that they are almost looking at that again there. So they did suffer a little bit with the Ross Lyon older players and in the late 2000s, going into 2010 there. But it was worth it to have a crack at those premierships. They were almost back-to-back premiers in 2009 and 2010. But for St Kilda, it's going to have to be a rapid rise there. So don't be surprised if they're big plays in the trade period. And the final team in our team review is, of course, the premiers from last year, the Western Bulldogs. They made it into the finals for the two previous years, but they failed to do it this year. They went to 10th place. 
and it looks like considering the superstars of their lineup who are retiring this year it looks like it could be the end for the Western Bulldogs in terms of getting into the finals and being one of the best teams in the competition. Could actually go either way with the Western Bulldogs there for me there. Just depends on how those players in their mid to late 20s develop. Certainly there has been a reliance on the older guys like Robert Murphy who you mentioned uh, as one of the retirements there that they've got there. They've also got Matthew Boyd who has pulled up stumps. And also Dale Morris will probably only have one more season to go in him there. So just depends on whether they can keep those right players out in the park there and whether they perhaps can get a couple of those free agents there. One of the ones looking at Trengrove. So if they can secure him, they've suddenly got another tall stock, which they do need. And they also do need Tom Boyd to come back there, who unfortunately did miss a lot of this year. So he's one that if they can get back there and he can progress with his natural development, they can still get back in the top eight there. But look, perhaps they just overachieved in 2016 and this is just the reality of where their group's at. Okay, it's time for us to take a break. You're listening to Selling the Dummy on Beers 99.9 FM Substitute Radio. We'll be back after this break. Welcome back. You're listening to Selling the Dummy, the AFL discussion show on Beers 99.9 FM Substitute Radio. I'm Chucker Wilson and I'm joined by Shane Scooter Coots. G'day, Chucker. All right, it's time to talk about some of the questions, debates, and controversies that have been taking up lots of column inches in the newspapers and really dogging the AFL in this 2017 season. And so these are the questions that people are wondering what the future of the AFL is, questions like exactly how clubs should be organised, really difficult debates that really test where the sport is and where the league is. So I'd like to start with the Dustin Martin, Josh Kelly incident where they have been offered massive amounts of money to go to North Melbourne where in excess of $10 million over the course of seven years which completely breaks with the model of having shorter contract deals. So what is up with this unusual contract offer? There's a few reasons why these players are being offered a lot of money there. Uh, the first of which being is the increase in the salary cap that's coming through, an extra $2 million for every club there. So they've got money there as a war chest that they haven't had before there. So they've got two ways they can either go about it. They can either do it the fair way, which is give everyone a little bit of a pay increase there and everyone's happy, or they can go after one of these uh, highly sought-after players just to top up their list there. North Melbourne are in a position where they, they don't have the players necessarily that deserve more money, and so they're ones who would go, okay, who actually deserves the money? And it's a player coming from outside the club there, so that's probably the biggest one that has come with this. The other one is that you have to offer a lot of money to get a player to your club there, especially when you're in the lower half of the ladder there, like North Melbourne, and likes and kill the like Carlton for the players who have actually gone after Josh Kelly and Dustin Martin and these types there, so... You have to actually offer a lot of money to actually make a player think, okay, do I actually want to accept this offer? Because if you only offer, say, 10% over what your current club's offering, you might as well stay for the loyalty and for the opportunity to play in a premiership, which both Martin and Kelly are in that position, even still this year, but especially in the coming years there. So it is a new scheme of things in terms of the landscape, but we are going to have to learn to live with it. One of the questions that continues to plague the AFL and comes up every single season is the question of the match review panel. The fact that adjudications are so often inconsistent over the course when you compare case by case, round by round. And it seems like there is no standard by which a player will receive a certain punishment for committing a certain act. And it seems like so much of this just depends on what's happening on the day and who happens to be on the panel. So what is wrong with the AFL match review panel? Is it a legal problem? Is it a judicial problem? Is there something wrong with the natural subjectivity of the sport? Where is this inconsistency come from? It's one of the hardest sports to actually 
give players a punishment for a certain act there with such a fine line there whether an act is actually perfectly fine or whether it results in a, in a suspension or a fine there. It is a really difficult job there. It's a case of damned if you do or damned if you don't with the AFL there. There has been a lot of scrutiny over the years, and so if the AFL make a change with either personnel or with the way they decide how to do things, that's where you get your inconsistency because in 2016, you look at something one way and in 2017, you look at something another way and people will pull examples from previous years there to argue the case about why decisions too fair or too harsh there. And so the AFL then will react to that criticism. They'll make more changes and it all starts again there. So probably the best thing they can do, and it's a pretty similar situation with the rules committee, is actually just leave it. Leave it for a few years. Make sure that they have a, a clear bracket of years of incidences so they can actually go back and go, okay, this incident's caused a one-week suspension. We've got something really similar. We are going to have to give them one week, even though, in our opinions, maybe it goes into that two- or three-week basket to actually add to that consistency there. What I don't think we want to happen is what we've had this year with a couple of suspensions for uh, what we appears to be overreactions. There was a clamp down on the punching this season. But unfortunately, it has crossed over the line in terms of two heavy suspensions for Tom Hawkins and Jack Redpath for certain incidences, whereby they've gotten what was commonly accepted as two harsher penalties there. So probably the best thing they can do is actually just hold off on major changes there, try and keep the same committee members on there for a growing period of time, several years there, whether it means they have to be paid more money, whether it means they have to be given more rewards for staying and being loyal, that may be half the something they look at there. But I think if they cannot actually make those changes, keep an eye on it, that's where we can get our consistency. Would you say there would need to be some constitutional changes to the match review panel to stop these <coughs> short-minded thinking, the fact that they would change the rules week to week and it would become inconsistent over the course of the season? Do you think there would need to be some sort of constitutional change to say we're going to have the same laws throughout the season so that we have a good body of evidence on which to draw conclusions at the end of the season? Look, it would actually get the results they're looking for, which is that consistency, but unfortunately with all the media that's actually going around there, uh, it seems like everyone's just getting their microphones and talking with one another there to discuss football these days. So with all the actual attention there that, that these decisions are being made there, you almost can't afford to just sit on it there. You almost have to make those changes. And, and certainly Gil McLaughlin's under that sort of pressure there to make sure that he answers the scrutiny, uh, make sure he puts things in forward in place there. So he's actually pressured to make decisions because if he doesn't, it actually looks like he's not doing his job there. So I hope they can hold off on it and I hope they can draw the line and go, nope, we're not making any changes this season. I almost don't think it can happen though with the media scrutiny. Let's move on to the coaching. Now, journalists in their naivete will often say that a coach's position with their job is dependent on their WL counter and that if you lose too many games you're going to be out and if you win games you're safe. But then when you actually look at the history of the AFL, someone maintaining their coaching position has much more to do with marketing or intra-club politics than what their actual counter is. And so you've got this absurd situation where Nathan Buckley, who has been leading his team to many more losses than wins over the course of the last couple of years, and looked like he was going to get the sack through the course of this home and away season, now is in a position of security. And then you've got Rodney Eade, who for a long time was secure and safe in his position, is now gone. This is a very inconsistent system in which coaches will come and go, depending on which clubs, depending on the time of the year. Well said, and some clubs will be under more pressure to change their coach there, and funnily enough, one of them is actually Collingwood there. They're under a lot of pressure there, being one of the more richer clubs there, to actually look at their coaching more regularly there, because they can afford to pay out a coach if they're selling a contract, if he's not the right man for the job there, so... The fact that they re-signed Buckley is actually pretty gutsy, in my opinion there. Ian McGuire actually has spoken on a couple of different other media uh, outlets there and has outlined that sacking would have been the easy decision. However, they do want to take the harder road there. So they have been brave for that decision, and I think it still will pay off for them. With regards to the Gold Coast... Probably the worst decision was actually another sacking of their actual inaugural coach there. Um, so with that decision there, where they actually brought in Ronnie Eade to, to lead this group to become a top eight side as opposed to a uh, bottom 10 side there, 
unfortunately, he didn't have as good of a group as what he thought, as what the club thought, and probably was what the playing group thought as well there. So uh, at least Rodney's trying to take him in the right direction there. And I think that, unfortunately, for Dean Solomon, for his games that he coached towards the end of the year, he had the rough end of it. He had a Port Adelaide side, especially in the last round, who had to win by a significant margin to jump above Sydney to go into fifth place. And so had to deal with those pressures as well, as well as a group who had effectively checked out the fact that they couldn't finish last there but they couldn't really rise up the ladder, and so they're almost better off losing to make sure they actually got the best position for the draft, which happens to be number two. So they can certainly go again there. But when it comes down to the, the coaching decision, certainly more clubs are more under more pressure to actually make that decision and go, okay, this bloke's out the door there. And there seems to be every one every year, which I don't think necessarily has to happen. So for the last couple of years, there has been a buy round which separates out the home and away season from the finals and for all previous years the finals was the week immediately following the final round of the home and away season and so this has allowed teams to regroup and rest this allows them to go raring to go when the actual finals begins and this has meant that there's a certain unpredictability with what round one of the final series actually is because rather than it being a continuation of the home and away season some teams are able to rest up better than others and so you have some surprising results the fact that the western bulldogs were able to win the premiership and bounce back is a surprise and now you have sydney who are doing much better than you would have predicted so it seems like the teams in the second four are really taking advantage of this bye week to really rest up so that when the chance comes to play in the finals they will be able to play really good football well said chuck and this has certainly divided a lot of people there in terms of its benefits and when listening to certain coaches and i think chris scott summarized it really well there that people's opinions on it might change just because of how their own club's going there. If their own club is the beneficiary of the bye week and they get players back for that first final there, they're going to be in favour for it. But if you're in the opposite basket there, you're going to be against it there. And considering last year we had the Bulldogs come up from 7th to win all four finals and we had the clubs who played only two games across the month because of the bye and then the week off for winning their qualifying final in West Sydney and Geelong, both losing their preliminary finals, it's not a good sample right at the moment for the AFL. We'll soon see if it's a bigger problem this season when you've got two of the most informed teams in Adelaide and Richmond. If they happen to lose, that's certainly then something to look at there. I'm of the opinion that the round can be done differently in terms of the last round and then in terms of the buys as well. What I would do is have the first buy, which is the one where they have teams resting across three weeks, across 9, 10 and 11, and have the full round buy in round 18 there. That way, what they can do is actually promote things like junior grand finals, which are happening about that time there on the Sunday, and still have things like the Women's State of Origin on the Saturday night and the EJ Witten Legends game on the Friday night. So it can definitely all work the same way, just bring it forward a few weeks. And it means all clubs are the beneficiary of the second buy, not just the teams that make the top eight there. So at the moment, I'm against it. But if we have a more normal final series this season there, rather than just the best team across the last four weeks dominating, then I think there may be a place for it. I'm of the opinion to change it, though. We have the Rod Butters affair. Now, a while ago, I coined the term the Shane Warne rule, which is that if you're able to perform really well on the field, it doesn't actually matter what you do off the field. It doesn't matter how many crises or emergencies you break out and how much you bring the game into disrepute. As long as you are doing great stuff on the field and winning games, then everything will be pushed under the rug. And this has happened in AFL, in the NRL, and in the cricket. It doesn't actually matter how horrible of a person you are off the field, as long as you're doing the right thing on the field, and you're within the networks and the connections within the sporting administration, then you're going to get a pass, and your indiscretions will not bring punishment for you. And so here we have a gentleman who has admitted that 10 years ago, while he was St Kilda president, he committed acts which are against the spirit of the game and are against the code of conduct. And yet, because he's a part of the football establishment, he was allowed to appear on the footy show earlier in this season. And so it seems like it, doesn't, it didn't actually matter what he did off the field. The fact that he is a winner, the fact that he's a part of the system means that he will always get a pass. Well, to fill people in, Chuck, on the whole incident there, basically what Rod Butters admitted to Damien Barrett on that interview with the footy show there is that while he was present there, he was taking cocaine, 
and also consuming significant amounts of alcohol there and making decisions while under the influence there. So uh, what actually helped Rod Butters in this is the fact that Sinclair had two different playing groups under his tenure that were successful. He had the 2004 group, who were just shy of a grand final losing to Port Adelaide in that preliminary final. And then he had the group that Ross Lyon took to grand finals across 2009 and 2010 there. So because he had these successful groups that were a part of it, things like that can actually go under the radar there. And sometimes it is tricky to work out if someone's actually under the influence or not when you perhaps you're either used to them or you may not want to make any judgments on how they are at the time there. So it would have been really difficult for the other Sinclair board members to, to speak out, even if they actually thought in their opinion that Rod wasn't actually okay there. Uh, the fact that it actually really disappointed Nick Raywalt, I think, is a good sign because of the fact that it means that any future presidents at St Kilda or any other club know that when they're greats, don't like what's happening there. Well, it comes with the bad media there. So I don't think there'll be another president or someone on the board quite like that. However, it just brings the reality of the game. That's not just the players who find themselves in those positions. Sometimes it can be board members too. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Selling the Dummy on Beers 99.9 FM Substitute Radio. I'm Chucker Wilson and I'm joined by Shane Scooter Coots. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back. You're listening to Selling the Dummy, the AFL discussion show on Beers 99.9 FM Substitute Radio. I'm Chucker Wilson, and I'm joined here by one of the great intellectuals of the AFL, Shane Scooter Coots. G'day, Chucker. We're going to be talking about the rule changes which the AFL introduced at the beginning of 2017. So I'd like to get your opinion, Scooter, on whether the changes were appropriate they've made a significant improvement to the quality of the game and you think that they've improved player safety so let's start up with the third man up strategy where a third player is not allowed to interfere with a ruck contest that it's only the assigned ruckman which is allowed to do that well they've claimed that this will make rucks easier to adjudicate that this will reduce injury to ruckman and it will make the ruck position a more valued and respected position because once you've assigned someone, you can't have a part-timer step in at any point. It was one that actually came as a bit of a surprise when I heard that it was going to change there. A lot of it actually comes from Geelong's Mark Blixarves being a tremendous athlete there at over 200 centimetres, but being actually fit enough to be a wingman and so being the perfect candidate for that third man up there, which over the years has been a part of our game. But there's certainly room for it to not be part of our game there. So this is not a bad rule change, but I think there's still a long way to go. With the parts that they've advised as an improvement on the game, I do agree with the ruck spectacle. I think more ruckmen are being given more respect there with their craft. Certainly you've got the tack ruckman over the years there, which is saying to come back there. You look at the players of years gone by, like Brendan Laid and Dean Cox. Certainly now the Ruckman of this current group there are being given more respect for their craft there, to the point where even at other media outlets, they're looking at up to seven different Ruckman for potential All-Australian honours this season that eventually went to Patrick Ryder. So certainly there's been a lot of improvements there. The injury side of things doesn't seem to jump out to me in terms of a decrease there, so that maybe have to be a wait and see. What I'd like to change, though, is the nomination side of things. The way I say it is that as long as there's a Ruck contest and only one player goes up from each side, or zero, if they choose to do so, then I think that's okay. I think with the confusion that's at the moment with some decisions, it's actually to do with the nomination side of things where players have to put their hand up to actually go for a ruck contest. I think that should change because it does look a little bit silly at the moment. The other major rule change which the AFL brought in was the stricter interpretation of a rush behind. And so they've actually tried to lay out uh, in a sort of legalistic language an exact interpretation of what a rush behind should constitute. And so they've marked out as criteria whether or not the player had prior opportunity to dispose of the ball, the distance 
from the goal or behind line and the degree of pressure that is being applied to the player at the time. And so it seems like it's not a huge change, but it seems to be a bit of a tightening of the system in terms of subjective interpretation and application. Well, Chuck, it definitely needed tightening because we certainly don't give players enough credit in their ability to disguise a rush behind there. So they're actually more clever than what we actually gave them credit for with the rule in its first place. The fact that not many of these free kicks are being paid, yet players were still finding a way to still achieve the same result of a rush behind. The fact that it's no longer like the situation with Joel Bowden with deliberately rushing behinds and also the 2008 grand final with Hawthorne means that the rules come a long way. I still think there's a little bit of work to go in terms of probably paying more free kicks to actually make sure that the players try and keep the ball in as much as they can there. So it's one of those rules similar to the deliberate out-of-bounds interpretation that still has a long way to go there, but I think it's actually coming along really well at the moment. Are you a believer of the principle of once burned, twice shy? The fact that if a free kick is given on a, on a reasonable basis, that that will just completely change the mindset of defenders and so rush behinds or semi-quasi rush behinds will just disappear? Maybe not to that extreme, but absolutely. I think if you have a season where you pay one or two free kicks in round one or round two, it will get heavy media scrutiny for the week leading up to the next round. And then from there on, the rest of the season will have players trying to keep the ball as much as they can there. So it's short-term pain for long-term game for me with paying these free kicks that you have to do it. And you also have to do it early in the season and probably fairly early in the games as well there, whereby if someone gets pinned in the first quarter or second quarter, it won't actually happen in the second half there. Players will be desperate to try and keep the ball in. Obviously within reason, but certainly I think that players will react if umpires start paying more of those free kicks. The only other rule changes which the AFL have brought in are related to physical contact and unprofessional and unsportsmanlike behaviour. So there is a tightening of the interpretation of a high tackle. There is stricter interpretation for punches and strikes to the body. There are greater fines for jumper punches. And clubs will be sanctioned more heavily when there are melees. And so there aren't any great overhauls or transformations. It's just more strict interpretation in terms of how players will physically contact each other. Probably both extremes with this this ones you mentioned before there. With the interpretations for punching, certainly that's a winner for the game there. When you look at things like rule changes or interpretations, the one thing to keep in front of mind is what's going to make this game look better and what don't we like about our game. And certainly things like punching is one of the things that we don't like about our game there. It doesn't represent what we want AFL to be about there. It's it's just one of those things that has just been a part of the game in years gone by. But certainly they are getting better at cracking down with it. Again, with the things like the Tom Hawkins and Jack Red Path suspensions, there's going to be some teething problems there, and so they are probably going to get suspensions wrong next year, and maybe even the year after, but we will eventually get it right there, and I think punching will just about be stamped out of our game. It's already frowned upon significantly, so I think that will come a long way in future years as well. Uh, with regards to the, the melees, this is one that has actually divided more people than perhaps maybe it should. The AFL is actually asking for more please explains from clubs about melees, which unfortunately there's no proper answer to give to that. It happens because of the testosterone on the field there. Players will get angry at an opposition player or decisions and they won't be happy about it. And so they'll remonstrate. They'll back up their teammates who may be in a scuffle. And so with that in mind there, it's really hard to give a please explain, especially from the clubs who those individuals making those statements weren't even involved. They can ask questions for the players, but they may not necessarily get the answers that they want there. So for me, melees aren't the, the worst thing in the AFL to have. But there'll there'll be there'll be work things to work on with that. All right, we're going to take a break. You're listening to Selling the Dummy, the AFL discussion show on Biz ninety nine point nine FM Substitute Radio. I'm Chucker Wilson, and I'm joined by Shane Scooterkoots. We'll be right back after this break. And welcome back. 
You're listening to Selling the Dummy, the AFL discussion show on Beers 99.9 FM Substitute Radio. I'm Chaka Wilson, your host, and I'm joined by the esteemed Shane Scooter Coots. G'day, Chaka. It's time to look at the Brownlow medal predictions. Exactly who are these people competing for the medal? How good have their seasons been? How talented and hardworking are they as players? So I have the top 10 in terms of who is most likely to win the Brownlow. I have taken out all of the people who are suspended or are otherwise ineligible. I'm going from least likely to most likely. And if you could just uh, mention how good they are, how good their season was, then we're going to get a real understanding of what's going to be happening on Brownlow medal night. So we're going to start with number 10, Joel Selwood. This is a name that normally comes up a lot higher in these Brownlow predictions there, but unfortunately for Joel, he didn't miss some games this year through injury and has also been behind Patrick Janefield in terms of uh, best on-ground performances and the attention there potentially from the umpires when it comes to votes there. So for me, Joel Selwood won't be amongst the, the top three or so. He certainly had a pretty good year, marked off by all Australian honours, despite only just being on the interchange bench. He certainly did a lot of good things there in his games and certainly helped you along to a lot of wins. However, I don't think he'll be holding up Charlie at the uh, end of the season. Uh, Number nine is Dane Beams. Yeah, Dane's come actually a long way there when it comes to his form at Brisbane there. There has been some injuries that he's had to go through there, and now he's starting to work really well with guys like Dane Zorko and also Daniel Rich. So he's had a fantastic season there. Perhaps a little bit unlucky not to be an amongst the All-Australian honours there and perhaps a victim of Brisbane not winning as many games as what uh, he would like and, of course, what the club would like as well there. So when it comes to Dane, I think he'll probably suffer a little bit just by being at that club there, but you can certainly expect him to be about that 10 to 15 vote mark. Uh, number eight is Clayton Oliver. One of the biggest risers in the AFL there. If you were to pick a player there with the biggest rise, Clayton Oliver would have to be in your discussions there. Become a fantastic ball winner from Melbourne, overtaken some of the likes of Nathan Jones and Jack Viney in terms of being the premier on-baller for Melbourne. Uh, he's been one of the reasons why they've actually risen up the ladder as sharply as they have over this season there. And he'll be one that, if he doesn't uh, get amongst the top three this season, he'll get amongst the top three in future seasons to come. So uh, well done to Clayton Oliver. Uh, he won't be the Brownlow winner this year there. However, he certainly will be in discussions in the coming years. Uh, number seven is Josh Kennedy. A fantastic season from the Sydney Premier on baller there. He has the captaincy for the first time there and was extremely unlucky not to get All-Australian honours. In fact, perhaps even being captain there if he had made the All-Australian team there. But he's had a fantastic season there. He's one of the big reasons why they went from 0-6 and six to finishing in sixth spot and will be still in the running for the Premiership there. So... Yes, a fantastic season for Josh Kennedy. He may fall a little bit short, and the fact that he's got guys like Buddy Franklin and Luke Parker taking votes off him there throughout the season there, and also Dan Hanabry. But he'll, he'll be amongst that, say, 15 to 20 vote bracket. Uh, number six is Robbie Gray. Bit of a role change from Robbie Gray this season there, playing more predominantly as that half-forward, deep-forward type there, playing a little bit in the midfield as well. Another All-Australian there with being on the forward flank for that particular team there, so he's another one with a fantastic season. He may not necessarily have a lot of people pinching votes off him there. You look at guys like Chad Wingard, Travis Boke, even first-year player Sam Powell Pepper may take a few votes off him there, but he could very well be amongst that 15 to 20 vote mark there. Probably just depends on how they saw his games in Port Adelaide's wins and whether he can get best on grounds on those. It may mean he could actually sneak into that top three there, but he's a fantastic player, Robbie Gray. Uh, number five is Marcus Bontempelli. Yeah, the Bonds had another good year there. Uh, probably not as good as his previous seasons there when he first hit the scenes for being one of the up-and-coming on-ball winners. However, he's still a young man, and he's got a long way to go with his development there. So with the Bulldogs going to find sort of that right role for him in terms of the amount of time playing in the midfield, amount of time playing forward, he will be in that top two uh, area for the Brownlow. A lot of earmarked him already for uh, Brownlow in the coming years there, and I wouldn't be shocked if he did win one. He's just got to come up a little bit with the development there. Again, he's probably going to be about the 15 to 20 vote mark, a victim of Bullogs losing a lot more games than what they thought they would, but probably not a lot of people pinching votes off him. Number four is Rory Sloan. Yeah, another good year for Rory there. Had a lot of pressure when Patrick Dangerfield left the club there to be the club's premier on-baller there. But he's also been a beneficiary of a lot of other players rising in terms of the amount of pressure on him. The fact that the Cratch brothers have come through and developed well. The fact that David McKay has recaptured form there. Richard Douglas is still providing a lot of assistance there across the midfield there. So Rory's been a beneficiary of that. 
slipped off a little bit, had a concussion issue during the year there, and, and certainly slipped off in form when being heavily tagged by opposition players. So he'll probably be, again, about that 15 to 20 vote mark there. I wouldn't be surprised if he actually slipped behind guys like Robbie Gray there in the in the vote count there. But another fantastic year for Rory, and obviously got bigger fish to fry with the Premiership and potentially coming up for him. And now we get into the serious contenders. Number three is Tom Mitchell. Tom had some fantastic games throughout the season there. He broke the 50 position mark in a game earlier this season there and has been the biggest recruit in terms of their immediate impact there from coming across from Sydney to Hawthorne there. So it's been a fantastic year for Tom Mitchell, capped off again by all Australian honours, and I wouldn't be surprised if he was actually in the top two with this season. Probably looking at that 20 to 25 vote mark there with Hawthorne winning quite a few games and him playing well in those wins there. He also might pinch ones or twos there considering how much bully accumulates even in those losses there. So uh, keep an eye out for Tom Mitchell, not even just for this Brownlow, but also ones to come. Second place is Josh Kelly. Yeah, one of the premier on ballers there from Greater Western Sydney there, Josh Kelly. Come a long way this season there, going from more of a role player in previous seasons to now being not only one of the premier ball movers for the competition there, but also one that clubs are keeping an eye out for and potentially trying to recruit there. So he's had a fantastic season there, another All-Australian there, and I wouldn't be surprised if he was the runner-up in this year's Brownlow. I think there's just one man who's going to beat him, though, and we'll mention him in just a moment. And finally, the player that is most likely to win the Brownlow medal is Dustin Martin. What a year for Dusty Martin there. One of the prime reasons why Richmond have gone from 13th to 3rd, playing a predominantly midfield role, but also kicking over 30 goals this season when pushing forward there and being effectively the second tall forward behind Jack Rewalt in that team. So he's had a tremendous season there. There aren't many bad games that come to mind there. I think he actually could break the record for most votes. You'd be looking at a 30 to 35 vote season there. The fact that his best games were in Richmond wins there and the fact that he go for kicks goals and gets a lot of the football there. So we could see records broken this season, but one way or another, Dustin will be holding the brown load this season. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Selling the Dummy, the AFL discussion show on Beers 99.9 FM Substitute Radio. We'll be back after this break. Hello and welcome back. You're listening to Selling the Dummy, the AFL discussion show on Beers 99.9 FM Substitute Radio. I'm Chucker Wilson and I'm joined by Shane Scooterkoots. G'day Chucker. And this is our AFL 2017 Year in Review episode where we're looking back at what we've seen in this home and away season for 2017 and reflecting on whether or not it's been a good or bad year and who has been the big winners and who have been the losers over the course of this season. So now we are approaching the retirements. So we're going to go through all of the major players who have retired at the end of this season and just reflecting on what type of careers they have, what type of football they brought to the sport and to the league over the course of their careers and how big of a gap will be in their teams when they leave. So I'm going to begin in alphabetical order. Let's begin with Adelaide's retirement, which is Scott Thompson. Yeah, fantastic ball winner Scott Thompson there for mostly Adelaide, but also Melbourne to begin his career there. Uh, Got traded across to the Crows there and has been a fantastic player for that club for uh, about 15 years or so. So he will be a big loss there. I think Adelaide can cover it with their midfield, the fact that they've sort of moved past him anyway. Scott Thompson's only played the one game, although he is on the emergency list for the most recent game against West Sydney. So still could get another game there, but I don't think he'll be unhappy if he doesn't get a retirement game, especially if it means that Adelaide's going to win the Premiership this season. So he's been a big part of that, why they're sort of up amongst it this season there. Uh, but he's been a fantastic player for Adelaide. Uh, Carlton's Dennis Armfield. One of those blue-collar players there, Dennis. Just an honest footballer. Goes about it in a really positive way there and wants, just wants to do his role for the team there. Will probably be a bigger loss than perhaps what some people would say there. 
Carlton should be able to cover it with some of the younger players coming through. Um, however, he's just been a really honest player there and one that, um, that they will miss there as, as true clubman. Collingwood's Jesse White. The big hope there for Collingwood for a number of years there, Jesse White. They were certainly hoping for him to be that key forward to work with Darcy Moore to be in that premiership window a lot sooner than what they will be there. Unfortunately, though, he's certainly not amongst their best team, and it's not surprising that he's decided to hang up the boots there. He did play some good games up in Sydney before being traded to Collingwood, so it's not all negative, even though he did finish in the VFL there. Um, certainly, Collingwood would have wanted a lot more out of him there, but he's been a very serviceable player when he's had the opportunity to play. Essendon have lost three major players. So the first one they've lost is James Kelly. James Kelly they got across from Geelong in 2016 after the players got suspended due to the Asada incident there. And he's been a fantastic servant for Essendon there. He'll always be forever a Geelong player, being a three-time premiership player for them. But he's done his role at Essendon there, and he got the opportunity to play in one last final there over the weekend. So um, best luck to him with what he does. 300-game player, uh, multiple All-Australian, and as mentioned, three-time premiership player. So be a fantastic player, James Kelly. They've also lost Joe Watson. Job, I think they can cover in terms of the midfield depth there, but it's good to see him that he actually got back out there this year and played some footing, played some really good games across the year. Watching him play, he didn't look like he was finished there, and he, he certainly is at the end of the road, and he's obviously made that official now there. So um, multiple best and fairest winner for Essendon there was the person with the most votes in the 2012 uh, Brownlow medal there. So certainly his best was very good, um, and he certainly will be missed in terms of a clubman there. Um, I think Essendon will cover him, though, in terms of their midfield depth when they recruit via the trade period and draft. And the third player that Essendon have lost is Brent Stanton. Been around for a while, Brent Stanton, there, and he's played his role within that midfield there over the last, say, 13 years or so. Probably been a little bit underrated in terms of the way he's gone about it there. He's accumulated a lot of the ball there in that midfield there and has done really good things there for Essendon. Certainly, he, he wasn't their best team coming into this season, and that was proven with the selection. Uh, however, it has been a good career for him. Fremantle have lost a few players. For starters, they have lost Zach Dawson. Yeah, Zach lost his spot in the team towards the end of this year there, and Ross Lyon made it public that he wouldn't be offered a new contract there, probably a little bit earlier than what we would have seen previously from other players there. But he certainly played his role across mostly two of his three clubs, mostly St. Killer and Fremantle, under Ross Lyon. He did play also at Hawthorne at the beginning, but that was more his initial development there and didn't all go so well for him there. But look, he's been very serviceable there and and will be a loss for Fremantle. I think they've covered him in terms of the selection towards the end of the year, but they've also been beaten by some big margins without him. So they may have to recruit via free agency there to get another tall defender. Uh, Zach certainly did his role over those years. Another player from Fremantle who has retired is Garrick Ibbotson. Garrick was another one who lost his spot uh, this season there and never was able to regain it back there, part of the new crop coming through for Ross Line there, so probably wrong place at the wrong time for Garrick there. There also has been a lot of injuries, which meant that he couldn't go on beyond this season there, so uh, being very serviceable was an important part of that Fremantle team that rose up the ladder and made that grand final in 2013 there, so very serviceable from him there, uh, and will be a loss for Fremantle down back. They've got some young defenders coming through there, so they should be able to cover him. Geelong have lost two major players to retirement. The first one is Tom Lonergan. Well done, Tom Lonergan, on the career lasting a lot longer than what it could have been. Obviously losing his kidney back in 2006 there. Has come back and become a premiership player for Geelong and a mainstay down back as well there. So um, started off as a forward and he actually kicked over 40 goals in one of his earliest seasons there. Um, so certainly did his role there. But he certainly has come a long way in terms of just being that uh, premier backman down there. Uh, has worked well with the guy we'll mention in just a moment's time there. But he'll be a big loss for Geelong. I think they'll look to recruit via a trade to get another call, tall defender to cover him. And the other player is, of course, Andrew Mackey. The partners in crime there down back, Andrew Mackey with Tom. Andrew's been around, obviously, for a long time. And not surprising, now at 33 years of age, he's decided to pull up stumps there. Probably the only part that was surprising is still being in that premiership window, the fact that perhaps Andrew might say if Tom retires or vice versa there. But look, if you have run out of uh, energy left and you don't have enough to offer the team there, it's probably best to, to call it a day there. And Andrew will leave with a little bit left in the tank there, still playing in Geelong's final series there and still part of their best 22. He'll be one that will probably, again, look to have to recruit via the trade period or perhaps use one of the earlier draft picks 
to get a another defender to replace him. But he's been a fantastic player for Geelong. Uh, GWS has lost one player to retirement, and that was Steve Johnson. Yeah, Stevie J, what an entertainer over the years for mostly Geelong, but also for GWS over his two seasons there. A three-time Premiership player when at times it looked like that he may not even stay at Geelong, going back to 2006, where he missed the first six games of the season there through club suspension. So he's actually come a long way since those days there. Norm Smith medalist as well with Geelong there, and also has won a club goal-kicking awards down there. So he's been a fantastic um, entertainer for the, the game there. We'll be sadly missed there. Perhaps there's still another chapter left to write there if you can get back into West Sydney's team. Hawthorne have lost three major players to their team, players that have been shaping their club and the AFL entirely for a decade or more. So first of all, we've got Jack Fitzpatrick. Yeah, he couldn't unfortunately live up to some of the potential Jack Fitzpatrick due to the concussions that he suffered during his career there, but certainly made his mark there in the last round of last season against Collingwood, kicking the winning goal to make sure that Hawthorne finished top four there. So he certainly did his role when he was in the team there. I think with Rockstocks anyway, the way they are Hawthorne, with Segler coming back along with McAvoy and Pionet, that... Fitzpatrick may have even been delisted regardless there, um, but unfortunately his career was mostly cut short due to concussions, so very serviceable when he actually was able to play for both Hawthorne and Melbourne. Another of Hawthorne's players to retire this season is Josh Gibson. One of the master strokes in terms of the trade period there for Alistair Clarkson recruiting Josh Gibson, found the perfect role for him in that Hawthorne team there, being that third or fourth tall defender, while at North Melbourne he was often playing on the opposition's best forward there. So they found the right role for him, and he certainly made the most of it there, being often third man up in forward 50 kicks inside there. And he uh, certainly did his role there across the three premierships there for Hawthorne. So a fantastic group and a key reason why that uh, back six was able to win those premierships. And finally, we have one of the superstars of AFL history, Luke Hodge. One of the final players from the 2001 Super Draft there, Luke Hodge there. Um, Certainly he played his role a long time for Hawthorne there. Even when he wasn't captain, he was the unofficial captain there before he took over from Sam Mitchell and definitely did a lot of good things over at Hawthorne there. Uh, He will be sadly missed there. And Hawthorne may not necessarily be able to cover it immediately there. They may not even want to look to try and do it immediately either. They may be more comfortable going via player development and via the draft there with guys like Ryan Burton. Uh, But Luke Hodge has done a fantastic job for the Hawks over the years. Uh, Melbourne have lost one player to retirement. It's Harrieta Lamomba. Yeah, he actually didn't play this season uh, because of the fact that he had uh, injuries and concussions, and so he actually pulled up some very early. He was still on Melbourne's playing list, though, for this season there, and so that's why he's actually part of this list as opposed to the last list. He did a lot of good things across Collingwood and Melbourne there, so um, with regards to his career, he definitely did a lot of good things there. Melbourne have well and truly looked to cover that there with their, their players across half-back there, which Harry would have played if... Uh, he was perhaps not injured or not suffering those concussions there. So I think they'll be quite okay, Melbourne, covering, considering that he hasn't played this season. Uh, Richmond have lost two players. There's Ivan Marek. Yes, with Ivan, he was a fantastic cult figure during his playing days with Richmond there. Came across from Adelaide there and certainly did his role as the number one ruck for many years there. Even when they recruit Sean Hampson, he was still able to be the number one ruckman there. And it's only really this season with Toby Nankervis coming through from Sydney that he was sentenced to the VFL and has unfortunately been there for most of the season there. So uh, he'll be one they'll miss uh, as a Cobb figure for the club there. Um, He's certainly done a lot of good things over his career. And the other player is Chris Yaron. Unfortunate for Chris that he wasn't able to get his feet off the ground there, and fortunately it was uh, due to some drugs incidences for Chris uh, coming across from Carlton there. Wasn't able to uh, take advantage of the new home there. Uh, He still might come back to AFL at the end of the day. It's obviously not his number one priority right at the moment. It's obviously uh, his health. But of course, there's a never say never a situation with these sort of things there. So right at the moment, uh, he certainly has wrapped it up, but he still could come back. St Kilda have lost three AAA superstars from their club who not only have made a huge impact on the club, the club's history, but also AFL. We have Lee Montagna. Yeah, Joey's been a fantastic player for St Kilda, a really important part of that midfield group with the guys like uh, Nick Del Santo and Lenny Hayes during their grand final days there, and he was a big part of that there. Uh, multiple best and fairest winner for the club there. 
and have been a fantastic servant there. So a bit unfortunate that his uh, career ended the way it did with the hamstring injury on the SCG there. Uh, but certainly that won't be what we remember him for. We'll remember him for the ball carrying that he did for St Kilda across their, their better playing days. And uh, Sean Dempster? An unfortunate victim, again, of multiple concussions, Sean Dempster there. Definitely was a very serviceable player, both for Sydney and St Kilda. Little known fact is that he actually managed to get to five grand finals across his career there as a role player. So uh, certainly he did a lot of good things for both of those clubs there. He'll be missed by St Kilda. They're not easy players to replace, those running types that are still that six foot two, six foot three uh, mould. However, St Kilda are developing down their backs regardless, but he will be missing out item. And thirdly, St Kilda are losing, of course, the one, the only, the Nick Rewald. What a champion of the game, Nick Rewald. Uh, arguably the best player to be pulling up stumps at the end of the season there, been a fantastic player. Uh, five-time All-Australian there, uh, multiple best and fairest, and one of the lean goal kickers in St Kilda's history there. I think he finished third, if I recall right. But regardless, being a fantastic player, a courageous player, a fantastic captain, and he will be sorely missed. I don't think you can replace a player like Nick Rewald. They've got other tall forwards, but they won't quite be the same. West Coast have lost four players to retirement, so we've got Sam Butler. Yeah, the last player from the 2006 Grand Final, Sam Butler there, has been a mainstay for the club across those years there. Only accumulated up 160 games in the end due to injury there, but certainly was a big role player for both John Worsfold and now Adam Simpson there at the club there. Uh, He's definitely played his role throughout and one of those uh, underrated players throughout his uh, career there, the fact that he was able to survive for this long, for 13 years, um, despite um, obviously a lot of good players coming through for West Coast, it just shows how good of a player he actually was there. I think they will be able to cover him with this new crop coming through, but he will be missed. Uh, next, there's Sam Mitchell. One of the players they recruited more or less exclusively for 2017, Sam Mitchell there, more for the, the coaching aspect after his career there, but certainly for, for one season as a player. Fantastic player at Hawthorne, a four-time Premiership player, one of those when he was captain still. Fantastic ball winner across those years. Brownlow medalist in 2012, so uh, he'll walk away with his career knowing that. Um, but look, he's been a fantastic player, mostly for Hawthorne, and I think he'll transition well into coaching there at West Coast. The other two players from West Coast who are retiring this year are two beloved sons of the club. There's Drew Petrie. Yeah, Drew came across after finishing up at North Melbourne there, playing 300 games for the Kangaroos and played this season there to cover Nick Natanui, who was out with uh, injury for the whole season there, and also Scott Lysett as well there. So he's actually found himself in the best team for a lot of the season there, and, and West Coast fans have been really happy with him as a recruit there. So West Coast have definitely got this one right there to get him across there as a, a mature rookie and then, of course, into their uh, senior list when the opportunity arose. So he's, he's been a really good player, one of the lean goal kickers of all time at North Melbourne there, um, and he will be missed by West Coast now as that backup ruck. And the other one is, of course, Matt Pridus. Yeah, with Matt Prittis, he's a fantastic um, ball winner across that midfield for West Coast. Brownlow medalist, um, multiple best and fairest winner. So um, he's one that um, are not easy to replace there. Even on the weekend, he was the highest ball winner against Port Adelaide. So he's one that they're not easy to replace there. Those are hardworking inside midfielders there. Um, he's been a fantastic servant for West Coast. And the final club that we've got to look at is the Western Bulldogs, and they are losing two of their most beloved sons, two players that will definitely go into the Western Bulldogs Hall of Fame. First is Matthew Boyd. Yeah, one of the key reasons why the Western Bulldogs made those consecutive preliminary finals about the time when St Kilda were up and about on the ladder there. Um, Often we forget the fact the Western Bulldogs were so good at that time and Matthew Boyd was one of the reasons for that. Fantastic midfielder there, working with guys like Daniel Cross and Brad Johnson to help the Bulldogs propel up the ladder at that point in time there. And even towards later his career when he won the Premiership, being a reliable halfback as well there. So, very good player across the years, Matthew Boyd. And finally, we have Robert Murphy. Yeah, Bob's been a fantastic player for the Bulldogs there. Uh, was very popular choice to be picked as captain there towards the twilight of his career after um, being a player for such a long time there, going back to the year 2000 when he got recruited there. Um, he's been a tremendous player across both half forward and half back, so he'll be one they they should be able to place there. The fact that they've got up and coming players to play those roles, but still a fantastic club servant there, and obviously a tremendously unlucky not to be part of last year's Premiership Six. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. This is Selling the Dummy on Biz 99.9 FM Substitute Radio. Don't go away. The wrap-up is coming right after this break.
Hello and welcome back. You're listening to Selling the Dummy, the AFL discussion show on Beers 99.9 FM Substitute Radio. I'm Chucka Wilson, your host, and I'm joined by Shane Scooter Coots. G'day, Chuck. So before we wrap up this program, I'd just like to get your thoughts on the AFL final series round two, which is happening next weekend. We have the Geelong Cats versus Sydney at the MCG, and then we have GWS versus West Coast at the Sydney Showgrounds. So two very exciting games of football happening next weekend. What are your thoughts? Well, with the Geelong Sydney final, that's probably the first final in recent memory that the side who's travelling and finished lower on the ladder is actually going to be favourites coming into this game there. Sydney have been in tremendous form over the last three months or so. The fact they've only lost to Hawthorne since round six, and that's why they deserve to be favourites against Geelong. They were very impressive against the Bombers over the weekend, and they definitely deserve to be favourites there. With Geelong, they can bounce back. I'm don't, not sure if they will happen, though, but they certainly have the ability to. They've got a couple of players going out with injury. Uh, Cam Guthrie is the biggest loss for them. They've got players still to come in, though, with Daniel Menzel missing out, unfortunately, with selection last week. I think he's one to come straight back in there to rejig their forward line that failed to score more than five goals against Richmond there. So uh, with the result, I still think Sydney will get over the line and book a date with Adelaide in the prelim. And then with the uh, Giants game against the Eagles there, well, the Eagles were the surprise packets of the first round, finishing eighth and almost being a little bit lucky to make the finals there. But they got the job done against Port Adelaide in extra time there and so deserved their semi-final spot. They have a chance to go over to Sydney and beat them at Spotless. Um, the Giants got done by them. It was last season or season before when Nick Nat Nui kicked the winning goal uh, to get the job done there. So the Eagles can do it, certainly. It's one that will be a lot closer than what people think. I do think the Giants will go over the line and get that date with Richmond in the other prelim. And that's the end of the program. Our AFL 2017 Year in Review program has come to an end. Thank you very much, Shane Scooter Coots, for taking the time and coming in and talking to us today. I know that a great many people respect you as a football mind and take your opinions very seriously, and they will be very appreciative and honoured of getting your thoughts on all these matters today. It's been an actual pleasure, Chuck, and we'd be happy to do it again. Uh, this has been Selling the Dummy, the AFL discussion show on Beers 99.9 FM Substitute Radio. We'll leave you with the wise words of Alan Jeans, who said, Footballers are like sausages. You can fry them, grill them, bake them. They're still footballers. Goodbye. <laughs>